Our text today is read from the first chapter of the first letter of St. Peter the Apostle to the Church, beginning with verse 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and to unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is grass, and the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Wherefore, laying aside all malice, and all guile, and hypocrisies, and envies, and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. As we move along, we should keep in mind that we have established, not only in this study of first long sense, that your soul is your life. It's amazing to me how the term the soul has created such confusion in the minds of biblical thinkers. Not only is the word the soul, which is a Greek word pneuma, which actually means breath, the same as the word life, which is the word pneuma, and used interchangeably by Jesus and the apostles throughout the scriptures, but it also in context so obviously refers to your life. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers, and on and on, evidently speaking of one's life. Now the Apostle says we are in a position to love God and to love one another in a right and a sincere way because we have purified, we have cleaned up our lives through obeying the truth through the Holy Spirit unto the unfeigned and unpretended love of the brethren. Now this is not a little aside that the apostle has come to to say to Christian people, along with everything else, you should love one another. But what Saint Peter is saying here is this is what it was all about, what it is all about, and what it will be all about. Love for God the Creator who created man in his own image to love him and to intercourse with him and to have family with him and to have a sense of camaraderie and community. That's why God created man, and that was what man was created for and to. To love God, to love his, and to behave and to act out of sincerity, out of love, and out of truth. This must be a love that is real, not put on. It must be a love which is fervent. In the Greek word ektenos means intently or without ceasing. This must be the basic motivation and drive of our lives to love, and to act out of love. Out of a pure heart, not corrupt, selfish, usurious, or showy, but a love which is pure. 
Interesting here in the 22nd verse as we began the reading to see that there are two different words here that are translated love in the King James. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto the unfeigned love of the brethren, which is a Greek word, Philadelphia. It's the word from which we get the, from which the Greek word phileo comes. It means a fraternal love, a kindness, a love of the brethren. Phileo means a fondness for, it means to be a friend, to have affection for, and to have sentiment toward it. It actually means to kiss, a kissing kind of love. We read in the scriptures that Christian people are to greet one another with a holy kiss, and this doesn't mean some mandatory and ritualistic duty which is bound upon us, which we carry out perfunctorily like we do our other liturgies of religion. It means the kind of fondness, sentiment, affection which causes people to embrace and to kiss one another. Somewhere along the line, the Christian church stopped carrying this out, whether it was because of peer pressure, whether it was because of the scorn of the world around them, whether it was because of offenses and abuses that broke out in the church, immoral and dishonest behavior by impure people, whatever the reason, the church of Jesus Christ in the world is not much in the habit of obeying the often given biblical commandment, greet one another with a holy kiss. But this is what St. Peter is talking about. Fraternal, sentimental, affectionate, kissing kind of love. That is the love of the brotherhood, the sense of Christian community. And then he goes on to say, seeing that you love one, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. And this second word, love, is the Greek word agapao. And it's that from which the widely recognized Greek word agape comes, and it means much love, love in the moral or social sense, the kind of love that God has, the love of God. And we don't think of the love of God of being hugging, kissing kind of love. We think of the love of God as being responsibility, duty, correct behavior, the interest in the other's good, the defense, the protection of others, you see. And this is what agape really means godly love, to do for the other, for the other's good, a moral love, a social love. See that you have this kind of love for one another, not only the affection, not only the emotion and the sentiment and the fondness and the hugs and the kisses, so oh, that's all right, as long as it is all right. In fact, it's necessary as long as it is all right. But there's another sense in which we love one another as God loves us in the moral, social sense. Love one another in the way you behave toward them, seeking their good, protecting them from harm. A love that has responsibility. See that you love one another with a pure heart. You know, in the first creation, by Adam, we were born into mortality, into the fallen creation, into a world of greed, graft, using shamelessly for our own benefit, immoral, disloyal, false, disillusioning, disappointing, unfulfilling, and death-dealing kind of a world because of the vice, the graft, the selfishness, 
of the fallen nature. And isn't that what this world is? Isn't that what we see around us? A young woman marries a young man because she thinks, here's somebody that really cares about me, really means good toward me. And what does she find out? That he uses her for his own good, that he's selfish about her, that she commits herself to him and he takes advantage, you see. And friends are that way and business dealings are that way and nations are that way and you see all of these grand expressions of we've got to look out for people in this world and we've got to help people and we've got so cynical with politicians and public figures saying that they're using these grand notions as stepping stones to fool gullible people into voting for them so they can get gain their own carnal objectives and that's what happens to societies and nations and cultures and civilizations in this world and what has always happened to it. Why? Because it's a corrupt, fallen, greedy, grafty, shameless, unfulfilling, death-dealing kind of a nature and a creation. That was our first birth. That's what we found that we had through Adam. We see it that way today, commonly, but my friend, it was always that way. It's just that there's less discipline, less shame, less disgrace in the abandoning of one's wife and family and running off after younger women or whatever kind of expression this greedy, selfish, immature, irresponsible character takes, you see. But in the second birth, it's different. Being born again, a new birth, a different birth, a second entrance into a new kingdom. Our second birth is not by the first Adam, but by the second Adam, Christ, the beginning of the new race of man. And by Christ, we're born into a world of immortality, incorruptibility, a world of charity, kindness, caring, protecting, purity, loyalty, truth, a fulfilling world, an encouraging world and nature, a life-giving realm, a life-giving nature, being born again not of the corruptible seed, as by our first birth, but of the incorruptible. You see, the apostle is calling upon us to recognize the nature of Christ and what it was that we were seeking to escape when we repented and came to Jesus Christ and what it is that we have found in Christ, what it is that we have come to through coming to him and being born anew. Incorruptible seed and incorruptible nature, that's what it's talking about. Seed has to do with the, the bloodline of the parent. Madam, we inherited this fallen thing that we have talked about. From Christ we have inherited a life and a realm, a kingdom which is incorruptible. And it's by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. What does that mean? Well, you can set before you on, the, on your table bread, fruit, meat, cereal, milk, and what happens? You eat it, and then what? It becomes part of you. It becomes the strength of your life. It finds its expression in the shape of your body. That's how you live. That's what keeps you living. And we set before us in the spiritual life the word of God, the bread and the drink of the Christian life, which finds its expression in our Christian character, our Christian being. And we feed upon the bread and the meat of mortality. It builds a mortal body a body which grows old and grows wrinkled and grows tired and eventually dies. But what does the Word of God build in the spiritual man? 
an incorruptible life. Well, I'm not saying that everyone who's religious or everyone who professes Christianity is pure and holy and righteous. We wish that it were so. We wish that it were always so in ourselves. We wish it were so in others. I'm saying that the incorruptible word of God ministered to us by the Holy Spirit, obeyed out of a sincere and a pure heart by the follower of Jesus Christ, builds a life which is incorruptible, which is pure, which is loyal, which is fulfilling, which gives life and abides forever. It does not die. It does not corrupt. It does not die in the sense that it endures endlessly in quantity. But more than that, much more than that, it does not die or corrupt in the sense that it has infinite quality. Having a promise, the apostle said, of the life which now is and the life which is to come. The word of God in the new incorruptible man produces that which lives and abides forever. We're not talking necessarily here about religion, although there may be some aspects of the man, the incorruptible man, which is religious, but we're talking primarily about life, about love, about camaraderie, about a sense of community, about a morality, about a social awareness. I'm not talking about a social gospel. I'm saying that the Man of God has a social awareness. He meets the needs, the legitimate needs of others around him. This is one of the most essential commandments of Jesus Christ and of the Bible. St. John said, How can we love God whom we have not seen when we don't love our brother whom we have seen? And if we don't give our brother those things that he legitimately has need of when we are in a position to do it, how does the love of God abide in us? A love and a life which has a moral and a social awareness. Well, you say that may all be, and there's some things about that that are interesting and some bells that ring with me, but I have to say that my basic interest in life is something I can see, something I can feel, something I can get my teeth into. I'm primarily interested in the here and the now and the more simple and observable and graspable things of life. That's where I want my expression. That's where I want my reward. That's where I want my glory. St. Peter said, all right, but be aware of this. All flesh is as grass, and the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. Mother and I have a little custom that we carry out in our lives. On Saturday mornings we drive way out in the country to a little roadhouse and we have breakfast and then we go driving, driving around through the countryside, just here and there looking different things in different places. Just today we drove way up in the western hills and up a little canyon and as we drove along, I said, Mother, look, the green grass is starting to come th up through the dry. It's starting to get green again. And Mother said dryly as she looked out across the hillside with her 88-year-old eyes, she said, yes, and it'll soon be dry and weathered again. The grass comes up green and exciting and fresh and new, and we say, oh, look, the green of a new season the freshness of new life. Ah, yes, but the dry season isn't far behind. The flower of the grass withers. The grass withers. The flower dies very soon. All the glory of man is just like that green grass that you see coming up out there. It won't be long before it's gone. We strive and we toil and we compete and we fight and we struggle to get a little place under the sun, to do something, to build some monument, to get some recognition, to have some praise of our fellows. And how long does it last? How long does it last? How soon will we be 
old and broken and beaten and no longer part of the mainstream and the younger people that remember us will give us such respect as they can but we'll just be dragging along behind we won't be able to keep up anymore the glory gone the physical glory withered death not far away listen friend listen friend you can't make it out any other way you just can't make it out any other way the glory of mortality is short-lived the life is soon gone all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as those pretty little flowers that will so soon be gone and will be no more. But you don't have to live like that. If you're a Christian today, or even if you're not, you can repent. You can come into the family of God. You can know this new life through this second Adam. You can become in your life and your soul immortal. You can begin to express yourself in a realm that is pure, that is holy. It doesn't make any difference what others are doing. You can do it. I can do it. It's open to us. God has granted us the chance. He's given us the opportunity. It's there for us. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Where is this life? How is it available to us? Why, the apostle said, this is the very word. This is the very word which by this good news, by this book, by this new covenant of Jesus Christ and those who deal with it and concern, are concerned with it and study it and express it are bringing it to you. This is the word which by the gospel, by the good news, is preached unto you. Isn't it good news to you? that there's something from God that you can put your life toward which is incorruptible? Isn't it good news to you that there's a fulfillment that can never be taken from you, can do that will never die or fade or lose its luster? Don't you remember what the apostle said in the beginning of this chapter? To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and which fades not away, reserved in heaven for you. How can we have it? Is there a simple, practical way of laying hold of it? Is it just religious talk? Is it philosophical, esoteric, mumbo-jumbo that is out there somewhere that we can't get a hold of? Or is there a real, practical reality to it? Why, the apostle said there is. It's just like the food that you set before you on your table. Wherefore, laying aside all this malice and guile and hypocrisy and envy and evil speakings, which immediately, as soon as the day opens up, begins to characterize the expressions of the fallen children of Adam, going out with malice in our heart, going out with deceit, going out with falseness, envying someone, speaking evil of someone, put that old thing aside and do this. As newborn babies, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. What do you need to do? Take this word of God. Ask God for understanding. And ask God for the strength to begin to apply it to your life. Just like people are telling you, Eat right and then exercise. Well, that's what the apostle is saying. Eat right, feed upon the word of God, and then go out and exercise yourself in the ways of God, and you'll grow just like a child grows when he gets the milk and he gets the exercise. And you'll grow up into a mature man in Christ if you are one of those who have recognized that God is good, that there is grace, that there is mercy to help. That's what God is that is asking for. He's come to Christ and take the word of God and feed upon it and express it in your life and begin to live a life which is holy and sincere and righteous and pure and filled with the love of God and the love of others. And if you do that, you will find the expression of fulfillment, the encouraging, life-giving path that has everything to do 
with what man is all about.